Joining me today is Kevin Saprell. He is Emergency Physician and EMS Medical Director for Ridgeview Medical Center. Thank you so much for joining us yet again. Thanks again for inviting me. Can you explain to our viewers what flattening the curve means? That is simply the hope of spreading out the number of patients seeking medical care for COVID over a longer period of time. The worst thing that can happen is that everyone gets sick at the same time over you know, a very narrow window of time, and that would overwhelm the available healthcare resources. And so just even looking at the curves today, it's still very linear. And that's a good thing as opposed to exponential, which typically viral infections increase in an exponential fashion. So we are seeing some signs that maybe we have spread this out, uh, allowing us to have the available resources for those that are seeking care. When you watch news programs, they talk about the, another peak, or we haven't seen the peak yet. Can you kind of give us more information about that, where that's coming from? Yeah, those are all just modelings based on population densities, the, the amount of positive tests that we're getting. And right now, the model is still suggesting that the highest number over a window of time that we'll see is probably going to happen in late June or early July. You know, talking about the, the peak hasn't quite come according to the models. So should people still be coming to the emergency room if they have an emergency? Should they still be calling 911 if they have an emergency, if it's not related to COVID-19? Absolutely. We saw a significant decrease in emergency department volumes about a month ago. It was quite strange, actually. Um, and I think it's just because people really were staying home, so there truly were less emergencies. But we also did have the fear that people would put off necessary health care. And, and I'm glad you asked this because it is a hugely important question to answer. People should not be afraid to come to the emergency room. Something that you thought was an emergency three weeks ago could still be an emergency today, and we want to see you for those things that are emergent. I will say that it, it is time to pause and maybe reassess what really is an emergency and what is just convenient care. And it's astounding how people have done that. And that's a good thing. We certainly still want to make most efficient use of our resources, but we absolutely do not want to discourage people from coming to the ER. And I can tell you our ERs are so clean and so safe. We have never cleaned rooms as good as we clean rooms now. We have made every single room in both of our facilities, Chaska and Laconia, negative pressure rooms, which means that the air is constantly sucked out of those rooms. Um, so that was an engineering feat that was pretty cool that the hospitals did and also posted on each one of those doors of those rooms is the amount of time we should wait before placing another patient in. So that's how detailed we are, how concerned we are about safety and cleanliness in the hospital. Let's uh, talk a little bit about testing. I think there's some confusion out there about testing and the purpose of it. Can you explain the purpose of testing? I mean, there are a couple of Obvious answers, you know, the, the, the primary goal of testing is to identify the presence of a COVID infection. Unfortunately, the test is not very good at that. When it's positive, it's generally positive. We don't think the false positive rate is terribly um, high, but we do know that the false negative rate is unfortunately very high, um, around 20%, perhaps higher for some or it, it depends on the exact assay they're using. But that's the unfortunate consequence of testing. And any medical test has false positives and false negatives. So that is one of the primary goals is to identify the infection and the, the, you know, the prevalence of it in the community to see how much of it is out there and that has, has obvious economic implications and kind of opening things back up. So that's the obvious. The not so obvious is also 
contact tracing so that if someone is sick and other people become sick, we can identify clusters. It's also important, some employee or employer perspectives to identify disease and know if it was kind of work-related. Um, we also use it in the hospital because as we get more uh, patients that have COVID, we want to keep them all in the same part of the hospital. And the best way to do that is to identify the actual infection. And finally, we also use it to allow for risk assessment for outpatient things. So when you come in the hospital, you may need some more tests as an outpatient and whether or not you have COVID can determine that. And as we open things up and do more elective procedures, we want to know, do you have the virus, whether you're symptomatic or not, before we go doing, for example, uh, routine surgeries, um, endoscopy, those types of things, we want to know if the infection is present. So how does the weather affect the COVID virus? You know, heat, humidity, sunshine, wind, rain? Most people speculate that the coronavirus is not as affected by heat and humidity as influenza is. Whether this will have a seasonal variation is up in the air. There are so many factors that, that play into that. Um, because it's also a societal behavior and being out and about more in the warm months. So we don't know. We don't think it's necessarily degraded by heat and humidity to the degree that influenza is. Can you explain respiratory droplets and how they relate to the spread of COVID-19? Yeah, we have learned a ton over the last couple months, in fact, about respiratory droplets. I think the last time I was here, the current guidelines would suggest that we didn't wear masks in public, and that's because we didn't know as much about it then as we do now. There is more and more evidence to suggest that this virus is transmitted. Well, we know it's been a droplet, which is just basically a small little um, glob of water that contains the virus. The question we didn't know is how small those could be, how much they might come out from normal speaking or yelling, um, we knew coughing and sneezing were risks to transmit those, but more and more evidence suggests that there are really very, very small droplets. So maybe there's an in-between between airborne, which is tuberculosis, which is basically the, that, that fungus can kind of float in the air and affect people that are just normally breathing. Maybe there's an in-between more like a micro droplet on the order of, you know, seven or eight microns in size that might be transmitting this. And it may linger in the air for you know, uh, several minutes. Uh, it may go further from someone who's coughing or sneezing than we first thought. And that's why the guidelines have changed to recommend people wear a mask when they are with people that they don't live with and cannot maintain six feet social distancing. So um, speaking of masks, how often should people be washing their homemade masks? Well, CDC suggests that they're washed after each use. Um, that's a pretty vague statement. And because uh, if you run into the hardware store for a minute to grab something and run back out and take it off, that would be considered a use. Um, it's a pretty short use as opposed to, you know, out and about all day wearing a mask. I think the answer is daily is probably good advice or on the order of after several hours of use. What happens is the longer you use it, the more moisture that builds up on the mask and the more stuff it kind of retains and perhaps the less effective it will be. So generally after a prolonged use or daily is probably good advice. Can you explain the difference between bleach, disinfectant and wipes? So disinfectants are chemicals that sanitize a surface. So generally, we don't use disinfectants on our skin. We use antiseptics. There are a number of disinfectants. Bleach is the old standard. It's been around forever. It's a third of a cup and a gallon, and you have a great disinfectant that kills almost everything. And I say almost because it has to be used properly. It should be wiped on the surface and allowed to dry for at least 10 minutes. There are also chemical disinfectants. So some of the wipes that you see have a chemical in it that kills microbes, um, but not all of them. 
Um, there are things, certain fungal or spores like Clostridium difficile is an infection we can get in our intestine that is not necessarily killed by chemical disinfectants, but is killed by bleach. So getting to the skin, then we have hand sanitizers and soap and water and wipes. Again, what's the difference and when do you need to use them? So the answer to that is as frequently as you can is a good thing to do. Wipes are the least effective, but they are obviously very convenient. The thing with wipes is just make sure you get it between your fingers. I mean, you really wanna to try to cover the entire surface of your hand. So the next category is the alcohol-based sanitizers versus soap and water. Soap and water is really just to wash away the virus. It's not to immediately uh, destroy the viral particles. So that's why hand sanitizer, they're generally alcohol-based. I think it's like 60% or more. They're so convenient. They are so effective at really immediately destroying the virus. And they should be used as, as often as you can if you're touching things that may potentially be contaminated. So what do you know, or what do we know so far about the mysterious inflammatory syndrome that's affecting children? It's a puzzling condition that happens after potential infection with COVID. We, we have a decent understanding of it because it's very similar to something called Kawasaki disease, which has been around for many, many years and is an inflammatory process that takes place generally after some sort of a viral infection. So this is very similar to that. It can lead to liver failure, renal failure, heart issues, a number of problems. I would say it's very rare. The bottom line is if a child gets infected and has um, progressive symptoms generally that extend weeks after the, the initial illness, abdominal pain, altered mental status, um, urinary difficulties, uh, chest pain, these kinds of things that we definitely need to see that child. It's very rare. We're learning more and more about it, but it's definitely something if you're concerned about is worth a phone call or a visit to um, your primary care provider. How is the health and the well-being of the employees of Ridgeview Medical Center? How, how are they doing? Thanks. I appreciate you asking that. Um, it is amazing how resilient and how positive um, they are. Now, my interaction is obviously with the emergency providers and the EMS providers. And we're a bunch of people that kind of like what we do. We go to work knowing that we could encounter all kinds of crazy things at any moment. And it's, it's really amazing to see how many are just so positive about this, how many actually are willing to work in other areas of the hospital if need be. And other hospital employees are also saying, well, I'll work anywhere you need me to work. And it's also a testament to the fact that we do have faith in our personal protective equipment and we're very confident that it's adequately protecting us. Thanks for asking that and, and overall we're, we're doing great and we're all staying healthy. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Minnesota's done a great job. I would say that we need to keep doing it. We, we're not done social distancing, people. <laughs> we have to stick with it. And it's easy to think that, oh, things are opening up. We are not past this. We are still in the early phases of this really starting to affect our healthcare system. And the more people can continue to, to socially distance, uh, wear a mask, don't take it off your face while you're talking to people, leave it on your face. That's when we actually need it. We still have a ways to go through this, and I hope people stay positive and stay safe and wear a mask and wash your hands. Thank you so much for taking time to do this interview with us today. We really do appreciate it. Thanks again for asking me, and happy to come back again if need be.